Welcome to Elevating Consciousness, the podcast that helps you discover deeper levels of truth, meaning, and wholeness. I'm your host, Artem Zen, and our guest today is a psychotherapist and professor. He received his PhD in psychology from Harvard University and shortly after completed his postdoctoral fellowship at McLean Hospital. He's the co-author of Attachment Disturbance in Adults, one of the most comprehensive works that address attachment repair. He holds workshops teaching these methods detailed in his attachment book to mental health professionals internationally. Dr. David Elliott, welcome to the show. Thank you, Artem. Thank you for your interest in my work and for inviting me to have this conversation with you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. And I'd love to set some context before we begin. Um, so one of the roles I play is that of a mental health educator. So attachment theory is something that I've been learning about for years. And it seems to me that it's one of the most critical things for us to understand if we want to improve our relationships and our mental health. And I ran across your textbook, Attachment Disturbance in Adults, Treatment for Comprehensive Repair, through your co-author, Daniel Brown. And I was actually Dan's, uh, one of Dan's meditation students briefly before he passed away. And for those who don't know, Dan Brown was a meditation master and a Harvard trained psychologist, really a powerhouse in the psycho spiritual space. Anyway, I think it's amazing that you got to collaborate with him on this book, which is probably one of the most comprehensive works on the topic of attachment. And due to its detail and depth, it's probably best suited for mental health professionals. Nonetheless, I think it can be useful work for anyone looking to learn more about attachment. And I'd love to really dive deep into this material, but maybe we can st first start at the very basic question of what is attachment? What do we mean when we're speaking about attachment? And maybe you can share some of the history of how attachment was discovered. Okay, sure. Uh, so just as a just to piggyback for a moment on your bringing up Dan Brown, uh, I'd like to really, really honor him uh, as well, just as you've done. Um, Dan Brown was the, um, you know, was brilliant in, in many different areas. As you mentioned, his, his meditation, being a meditation master and, and, and uh, holding many retreats and helping many people with their mind and consciousness development and have not only taste of awakening, but, uh, you know, full, full embodied, uh, consistent and stable uh, experiences of awakened awareness. So uh, you know, he was quite quite remarkable in that way, and he also was um, was was brilliant in the area of psychology in many different areas. He was uh, internationally recognized as uh, an expert in hypnosis and hypnotherapy, trauma and trauma treatment, and of course in uh, around attachment and uh, issues of secure and insecure attachment, and helping people with insecure attachment in the context of therapy develop earned security. So um, back in around 2008, uh, uh, Dan brought together a group of, of other psychologists, uh, I, myself included, to have a kind of a, a study group together to take what was known within the field of attachment psychology, which is a very, very large field, um, and to, to develop some of the, particularly the therapeutic applications uh, toward developing attachment security. There's been so much known about attachment itself, uh, so much research done on the phenomena, on how it develops, how secure attachment develops, how insecure attachment develops, a um, whole lot out there. But um, there, had, there, there hadn't been so much about effective and efficient treatment. So as a group of psychologists with practices uh, in which we regularly encountered people coming for help with a whole variety of mental health issues that we recognized as having underlying attachment insecurity, we felt that it was very, very important to, to uh, find ways to develop the field of attachment psychotherapy uh, as well. And so Dan, with his background in that, called a group of us together that he thought might be able to work you know, effectively toward this goal. And for years, we met regularly and, and, uh, and worked on that. 
and as you mentioned, the the outcome of that was this was this uh, rather rather heavy book. Uh, it's good for developing the mind and the body if you use it physically. Um, and uh, half the book reviews what's known as we see it uh, within the field of attachment in terms of the principles and developmental issues and all of that. And the other half of the book is really focused on treatment and detailed practical guidance for psychotherapists about uh, how to treat the various and varying phenomena of attachment insecurity. Now, it's a, <clears throat> as I said, it's a huge field and there's a whole lot known. So what, what I'll present and speak about in response to your, your question and, 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 and in the midst of our dialogue are what, what we and then I have picked out to be most particularly relevant um, to the applications for treatment. Right. And obviously, there's a lot to say about that, and uh, uh, so I'll dive right in with in responding to your, your getting back to your question. Now, attachment itself refers to how somebody experiences important relationships in their lives. It starts with the experience of the infant, of ourselves in infancy in connection, in relationship with our caregivers. Uh, particularly, there's a primary caregiver. Usually it's the mother, but certainly it could be the father. It could be um, any, any consistent caregiver or, or person, adult, adult, who takes on the responsibility of being present and caring for the child. So the attachment experience psychologically and emotionally has to do with how that infant experiences that very important relationship. If, if secure attachment develops, or if that infant experiences the caregiver in a secure way, what that means is that experientially, there will be a, a sense of confidence about the safe and reliable availability of that caregiver. Mary Ainsworth, who is what I, I consider the mother of the attachment field, uh, John Bowlby was the father of attachment field. Uh, Mary Ainsworth, John Bowlby himself said, Mary Ainsworth didn't get enough credit within the field for her contribution. So I like to highlight that, you know, the two of them, the mother and the father, each had really essential contributions. Um, so Mary Ainsworth highlighted that she she described attachment security as the state of being untroubled about the availability of the attachment figure. And I love that, that sense, the state of being untroubled about the availability of the attachment figure. The sense that when I need him or her to be there, they'll be there for me. And I won't always need them to be there, but when some need comes up, when some discomfort comes up, or when I just want to be in connection, with them, they'll be there, okay? So the state of being untroubled about that. If we apply that to other important relationships in our lives, so moving from infancy to adulthood, obviously a close romantic connection, a partnered relationship is also a very important relationship. So how we experience that relationship has direct parallels to how we experienced the early relationship with our caregiver, or caregivers. So ideally, a secure adult relationship, partnered relationship, is a relationship in which we feel untroubled about the availability of that partner, that we can count on that partner being present for us in certain, in certain ways. Obviously, there are many relationships where there, there is the feeling of being troubled about the availability of the attachment figure. We'll talk about that as well. Um, but insecure attachment essentially is where the child or the adult does not feel that there is a consistent and safe and reliable connection with the important other. So again, being, being troubled about the availability of the attachment figure is, is, is how we would define attachment insecurity. 
So that's that's a that's a, a an overview about that. Yeah. Um, so from from here, I'm kind of curious if we could unpack the different attachment styles or patterns, and like you have the secure attachment with which you've already spoke about, and then how how does what are the different patterns that insecure attachment manifest in? Sure. If you could sure. describe them a little bit. Yeah. Sure. So, so again, starting with a bigger context, um, <clears throat> it's estimated that that in Western culture, let's let's just take the United States to where we both are at the mo- we both are at the moment. Um, it's estimated that up to fifty percent of adults have some form of insecure attachment. Okay, some estimates are sixty percent secure, forty percent insecure of adults. Um, but more recent estimates suggest that maybe it's even like 50% secure and 50% insecure. And even with those who are secure, it's recognized that when there's relational stress, maybe up to 90 or 95% of people, even secure people, will show some of the insecure patterns. Okay, So this takes us to your, your question about insecurity. Um, depending on the particular developmental experiences that a child has, he or she will have a sense of security, which I've defined, or one of several forms of insecurity. Now, insecurity reflects a defensive adaptation to the sense of being troubled about the availability of the attachment figure. Okay. I think this is a very important point because it, it moves away from pathologizing the, 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 the insecure patterns. They can be problematic. They can create difficulty for a person individually and in relationship, but they're actually attempts to adapt to uncomfortable experiences that happened very early in life. And those adaptations, for various reasons, will continue unless they're addressed and resolved at some point beyond childhood. They will tend to continue later into life, into adolescence, young adulthood, and adulthood. Um, And again, there are attempts to try to cope with the difficult experiences. So one of the one of the prominent there's various ways to, to sort of carve up any pie, okay? So we take, we take a natural phenomenon and we apply the ways that our human minds work. And in order to understand better, we tend to categorize. We tend to break, break the natural phenomena up into various subcategories so that we can understand them better, we can research them, we can talk about them. I highlight this because I think it's important to recognize the limitations of what our minds do to any phenomenon, that it's useful, but it's what our minds are doing to the phenomenon. One of the ways this manifests in the field of attachment is that there are various ways to carve up the attachment type, attachment subtype pie. And one of the most the, the most common way is to say that there are four categories of attachment secure and then three subcategories of insecure uh, dismissing or avoidant anxious preoccupied or and, and also disorganized in the literature and the research pertaining to children these were initially described as avoidant um, anxious, uh, anxious, ambivalent, and, uh, um, and disorganized or disoriented. Yes, yeah, anxious and ambliv- ambivalent one also preoccupied sometimes. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, there's different terms within the field for the child forms and for the adult forms. So uh, the ambivalent or anxious ambivalent is in the adult category in the way we describe it, anxious preoccupied. So, so As we continue talking, I'll say, I'll use um, avoidant or dismissing 
anxious, preoccupied, and disorganized. So that's the four primary categories. There's, there are other models that have looked with more specificity at the various subtypes. So Patricia Crittenden, who's a, a brilliant researcher, contemporary researcher uh, in the field of attachment, she has a model where during adulthood, there are 23 potential subcategories of the attachment types, and they can be reliably identified and, and fruitfully so, so uh, uh, we can understand with more granularity and more specificity some of the particularities. From four to 23, we might say there are as many subtypes of attachment as there are human beings, because everybody's different. And that's a very important perspective for a therapist to take when someone comes into the therapy room or on the therapy Zoom screen. Um, you know, that, that even though there are particular patterns that appear, everybody's different and we want to meet that particular person where that person is. All right, so that's a, a big context, which you're, you're learning. I'm, I'm big on setting context before talking about particulars. Back to your question. So anxious uh, or dismissing or avoidant. When a child experiences, so the biological way of looking at attachment, which John Bowlby was particularly interested in, and then the early early uh, field of, of, of attachment starting in the 30s and the 40s, um, it was recognized that we are, we, we are biologically encoded to seek connection with our attachment figure. Okay. Why might that have developed evolutionarily? Well, to support our survival. Okay. The, an animal, say a, a deer out in the wild, who is more prone to orient towards staying close with the mother or with the herd, is more likely to survive against the threat of predators. Okay. Humans who unlike deer, are not able to walk within, you know, minutes after birth, uh, are so dependent on the caregivers for a very long time that there's also encoded within us ways that we try to orient toward the caregiver. We can't go to the caregiver, but we try to capture the caregiver's attention so he or she will come to us. We, we smile. Okay, the smile, the, the smile within the first days of, of, of an infant after birth, for most caregivers will capture the attention. That'll feel good and, and the, the caregiver will, will give attention to, to that child. A very different kind of um, attachment connecting behavior would be crying, captures the attention of the caregiver. It's probably aversive rather than appealing, but it still captures the attention of the caregiver and hopefully the caregiver will then come to the infant and provide what's needed to soothe or comfort the child. If over time this, this kind of dance of seeking connection and establishing connection, the, the, the caregiver also feeling connected to the infant and wanting contact with the infant, where both have this sort of satisfying interpersonal dynamic, if that occurs really, really well, or actually in a good enough way, then the security will develop. But if when the infant is seeking connection, when the young child is seeking connection with the caregiver, the caregiver actually more often than not, or in some significantly uncomfortable ways, is rejecting of that child's entreaties for contact, for connection, for soothing, for care. The child will come to learn that seeking contact is, is aversive. Seeking contact is likely to lead to some uncomfortable experience. And we'll need to adapt to that, okay? O over time, of course, we're, it's, built, it's built into us. It's encoded in us, biologically, evolutionarily to seek contact, to, to orient toward the caregiver. This is called proximity seeking, closeness, connection seeking. But if the infant 
and young child has enough experience that every time proxim proximity was sought, some sort of uncomfortable experience was created, the child will adapt to that by shutting down that proximity seeking, by not orienting toward the caregiver, by figuring out how to solve the problems himself or herself. Okay? The child will become what's, what Mary Ainsworth initially referred to as avoidant, will avoid contact because contact becomes threatening. The child learns, again, to be on one's own. The caregiver will tend to, the, the avoidant caregiver, somebody who behaves in these rejecting ways, perhaps because he or she experiences as a child, will, because he or she also doesn't want contact so much with the child, will be supportive of the child being on his or her own, figuring things out, playing on his own, exploring on his or her own. Okay? This gets cultivated, this gets internalized by the young child and becomes an expectation about relationships, becomes an expectation about close relationships. So if I, if I had discomfort when I experienced, sought and experienced closeness with my caregiver, that gets encoded in me. It's a learning, it's a learned experience. It's an, there's an internal representation of attachment relationship that gets established. It's an internal working model that acts as a predictor about what will happen in future relationships. So that when I start feeling close with somebody in my adult life, if I have this avoidant memory, this internal working model, this set of experiences that got laid down, not only in my cognitive memory, but even more importantly, in my body memory. You know, I felt uncomfortable. I felt tense. I felt hurt when I was close with somebody early on. When I start to feel close with somebody now, that will get activated and I'll get afraid. And what will I do in response to that? I'll pull back. I'll avoid or I will maintain some optimal distance from the other by perhaps dismissing. I might like be critical of my partner. What's the effect? What's the constructive effect of being critical? The partner will move away some, and then I will have that distance so I won't have to feel so scared about the closeness. So dismissing avoidant pattern, the dismissing avoidant pattern tends to emerge in this particular way. And then the anxious preoccupied pattern tends to occur when the child, more often than not, I'm saying child and infant here. Let me highlight that the critical period for the development of the attachment representations that I was just describing, the internal working models, is the first two years of life. Okay, so, so this is very early relational experience. And it, it, it's, it, it has to do with the, the, the developmental dynamics um, cognitively and relationally during those first two years. There's a whole lot going on during that period. And um, uh, so if during those first two years of life, the child who's wanting contact, who's wanting safe, stable, reliable contact with the caregiver, primary caregiver, experiences that caregiver as unreliably available, say intermittently available, sometimes there, but sometimes not there. Say more often than not, distracted, um, maybe because the caregiver himself or herself is anxious, maybe anxious, preoccupied, then there's a lot of self-absorption, a lot of self-involvement, a lot of sort of anxious states that interfere with the ability of that caregiver to be present to the child, to be present and attuned. The child needs to learn ways to, again, try to get the care caregiver to be attentive in some way. And 
to to stave off the fear that the caregiver will be unavailable. Because if the caregiver is unavailable during certain critical early experiences, certain uncomfortable problematic states, then the child will get really afraid. That sense of being alone can lead to, you know, almost uh, annihilation fears at such an early, such an early age. So the child needs to, what the child tends to do is get preoccupied. The child will feel some anxiety and get preoccupied with the relationship with the caregiver to try to make him or her be available. This is actually a foundation for the common pattern that we know about as codependence, the tendency to focus more on the other's needs in relationship than on our own needs. So the child learns to become very involved with the caregiver to try to soothe the care calmed so then the caregiver might be more available to the child and to provide what's needed. This is um, particularly relevant now for, for parents in our, in our current culture around distractibility. You know, as we know, there's a lot written about social media and smartphones and uh, the tendency for people to have limited attention spans. And of course, I'm sure all of us can, can bring to mind experiences of either in ourselves or witnessing people around carrying a, a young child, an infant, and, and being more involved with the phone than with the infant. Okay, so I think there's a, there's a tendency toward greater likelihood of this anxious preoccupied pattern to appear because of this kind of societal trend and phenomenon that's, that's occurring now. Um, now, the third, uh, a third insecure subtype within this particular categorization framework is the disorganized type. And again, if we think about the, the patterns as adaptations that, where the infant tries to cope with the distressing experiences of uh, problematically available or inconsistently available or rejectingly available caregiver, the disorganized pattern Initially, um, uh, Mary Main, who was a student of a graduate student of Mary Ainsworth, um, and, and, and working together with Mary Mary Ainsworth, they they described this fourth category as as can't classify. It was a subgroup of of infants in their research, where who who didn't show either the the avoidant or the ambivalent pattern. So when they were thinking of these just three subcategories, secure and two of insecure, they said, well, here's a group we can't classify because they showed behaviors that were sometimes avoidant, sometimes ambivalent. Well, in some relational developmental circumstances, it would be adaptive for a child to sometimes show the avoidant pattern and sometimes show the ambivalent pattern. Perhaps a, 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 you know one of the parents in a two-parent family was of the more avoidant type and more rejecting, and so the child would need to adapt to that when with that caregiver. And perhaps the other parent was more anxious preoccupied, and the child would need to learn adaptive strategies for, for that particular experience as well. So in adult life, then there's a mix or a combination of these, these uh, defensive strategies that would appear. And so this is often referred to now within the field as the disorganized form because it's not organized into one of the two primary insecure subtypes. But a lot of people, especially Pat Crittenden, who I referred to earlier, and I'm aligned with this way of thinking too, disorganized doesn't do justice to the mm, adaptive brilliance that, that children uh, that we have as 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 organisms, and 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 one way to look at the so-called disorganized pattern is that there is organization within it. It's just a combination of the of the adaptive strategies that that appear. Now, one way that the term disorganized does apply 
um, to this other category sometimes, or to some people that get identified within this insecure category, is that the develop among the developmental circumstances that can create this this insecure subtype is the experience of being really frightened by the caregiver. The caregiver may have disorganized states himself or herself, may be dissociative because of unresolved trauma, um, may, may have very poor emotion regulation because of early insecure uh, experiences and developmental factors. And so the child does not feel the sense of the caregiver as safe and and stable, and that can be very frightening for the child. And when the fears come up in that context, if the caregiver is disorganized or has unresolved traumas that can easily get triggered, the caregiver is likely not to be available to help soothe the infant and uh, reassure the infant. And so states that are very unpleasant that don't get resolved um, is a term that's used within the field, fear without solution. Okay? And if you think about the developing organism and the de developing nervous system of an infant, if fear states get prominent and don't get resolved in a good enough way, that's going to affect the development of the nervous system in ways that will set into the nervous system the tendency to get overwhelmed, the tendency to not have good emotion regulation. Um, and so as an adult, then those negative problematic states will become prominent and will look disorganized okay? and create real problems personally and interpersonally for that for that person. Um, let me say one more thing about the developmental dynamics. Research has highlighted that infants with secure attachment by two years of age show more rapid development, more rapid de brain development, more rapid and earlier mm, developmental milestones being reached, cognitive developmental milestones being reached. Children with insecure attachment as a group will tend to show slower developmental progress. Brains, the brains don't develop as rapidly. There are three categories psychologically that I'd like to highlight as particularly important uh, for the field of psychotherapy. Um, Insecure attachment will tend to, well, let's, let's frame it positively first. Secure attachment will support self-development. Okay, Self-development means the development of self-boundaries, self-identity, self-esteem, um, stability in the face of stress. Okay? Insecure attachment, self-development is impaired in various ways to varying degrees, depending on the, the patterns and the particular experiences. Um, also, relational development is supported by secure attachment. Secure attachment is fundamentally established by a healthy dynamic relationship between the infant and the caregiver. That healthy dynamic relationship gets internalized and creates skills within the infant for re relational dynamics later in childhood and all into, into life beyond. So when there are problematic relational dynamics, those get internalized and the child will show relational problems later in childhood and onward into adulthood as well. When there's secure attachment, there is a greater tendency to develop emotion regulation skills, the ability to effectively respond to emotional distress when it comes up. As human beings within the world, or as just, let's say, as living organisms within the complex and challenging world, we experience threat. We experience various emotional turmoil forms. Ideally, 
We have a full range of capacity for emotional experience that supports the richness of life. And also, ideally, we develop the capacity to regulate those emotions, to not get overwhelmed, disoriented, overly disturbed by those emotions. Okay? Emotion regulation is also fundamentally developed through a healthy, dynamic relationship between caregiver and infant. When the caregiver is attuned to the child and recognizes that the child is emotionally upset and is able to be attentive and effectively responsive to that upset and provide soothing and comforting for that child, the child has the experience of having an upset, being recognized, and being soothed and comforted. And if that happens over and over and over again, to a good enough degree, that child internalizes the ability to be soothed. The child internalizes the experience of the caregiver being soothing so that now later in my life when I get upset, if I'm secure, then I have an internal working model of that's effective at emotion regulation and self-soothing. When the caregivers aren't effectively soothing consistently enough, child doesn't develop these internalized emotion regulation abilities and will have more emotional difficulties with uh, perhaps overwhelm and, and, and dysregulation later in life. So security sum- supports self-development, relational development, and emotion regulation development as well. Yeah, um, thanks so much for unpacking that and formulating that in such a beautiful and concise way. And I I just hope that the listeners are catching how important attachment really is in so many ways, starting from the development of the child, where insecure attachment uh, leads to delays in their ability to reach certain developmental milestones, and then transferring over to their relationships in adulthood, and in their ability to regulate emotions. So it's just fascinating the impact that it can have on on a person's life. And I guess I'm curious to, uh, well, and maybe the listeners are curious to like, what are some of the ways that someone can find out what their attachment style is, whether they're secure or insecure, and if they're insecure, in what way they're potentially leaning? Great. Okay, absolutely. And, and, uh, let me let me say something in response to what you were first talking about around the importance of this, because because there's something else I can I can add to 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 highlight that even more, which is that it's research has recognized that attachment insecurity underlies a lot of mental health problems. Okay, so this early foundational circumstance of security or insecurity has a big role in our mental health and well-being much later in our lives. Okay? I mean, or starting during infancy and through childhood and later in our lives as well. So if we have secure attachment by two years of age, we're more likely to be psychologically and emotionally resilient, um, able to handle the, you know, the challenges that come up uh, interpersonally and, and, and what personally and what the world can 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 throw at us. If we have insecurity by two years of age, we're more vulnerable to being problematically affected by the challenges that happen internally and externally. So even with somebody, so one of the reasons that I I got really interested in this whole field was that for many years I would practice as a psychologist and people would come with various forms of difficulty, not necessarily presenting as as an attachment-related problem. But it became clear to me that if, if, and now the research validates this, that, that if we pay attention, when someone comes to psychotherapy with a certain problem, De, you know, depression or anxiety or certain type of self difficulty, even obsessive compulsive disorder or something like that, alcoholism or some sort of addiction. If we 
if there is an underlying attachment insecurity, the treatment itself becomes more effective and more efficient if we pay attention to that insecurity first. Okay. So the so the, the vulnerability that is created by attachment insecurity makes us more vulnerable to all sorts of psychological difficulties later on. We become less resilient against the challenges and therefore more affected by the challenges that, that come to us. Um, so this is one reason why I think this is such an important field. Another reason that it's very effective, and we're going to move beyond the individual level to the more collective level now, is that um, when there's attachment insecurity, there's a greater likelihood for various ways of seeing, ways of thinking, ways of reacting in the world and to the world that I think contribute to a lot of the social problems and, and, and collective problems that we see these days. So and this was this was very important work that looked at the association between insecurity, attachment insecurity, and phenomena such as stereotyping. Okay. There's a greater tendency to have to adopt stereotypes. Um, there's a there's a more difficulty with tolerating ambiguity. So a greater tendency to take perspectives that are all or nothing or either or. And of course, the all or nothing or either or ways of thinking tend to lead to stereotyped interpretations of things. It's like, well, no, you know, if he's this, then then he must be that too. Or if she's this, then he must be that too. Okay. Lower tolerance for ambiguity, lower tolerance for recognizing the complexity of, of phenomena. A greater tendency toward cognitive closure. Okay. Like once once I am once I have a certain view of something, I'm going to stick with that view. Even if new information comes that's contradictory, to my belief, nope, nope, this is the way it is. I'm going to see the world this way. I'm going to see you that way. Okay. So I think, you know, just thinking about the effects of these, uh, of these mm, phenomena at a collective level, it also highlights why it's very important to pay attention to some of these issues of attachment, security, and insecurity, and ultimately how parents can best support the development of attachment security in their children. And one of the ways that parents can best support attachment security in their children is to pay attention to the presence of security or insecurity in themselves. So back to your question about how to identify what, as an adult, what our own attachment patterns are. And the attachment Pertaining to parenting, attachment, security, or insecurity tends to get passed on down through the generations. So if a parent is secure, his or her child is more likely to develop security. If a parent is insecure of a particular subtype, the child is more likely to develop that same insecure subtype. I say more likely, it's not a given, it's not, you know, uh, inevitable. But there's a greater likelihood in that, in that circumstance. Back to Pat Crittenden, this is the third time I'm mentioning her. Um, she says that the best way to help a child develop security from insecurity is to treat the insecurity in the parents first. Okay. I, see, I, I experience this quite frequently in my practice with, with adults. Uh, say somebody who's a parent comes in and we do work, attachment-oriented work toward helping them develop security or earned security, as it's called. So many parents who go through this process therapeutically, at one, some point or another, in one way or another, come in and say, you know, I feel like I'm becoming a better parent. Uh, I feel like I'm loving my children more. I feel like it's easier to be present with my children. You know, things like that. All these factors that will tend to support security in the children. 
So attachment patterns are pervasive. Attachment, even if somebody has attachment security, they are more likely to have one of the, say, adaptive insecure patterns show up during times of stress. Okay? When we talk about attachment insecurity, that's a kind of a more clinical determination that the presence of the patterns go beyond a certain threshold. What that threshold is, that's subject to many ways of consideration and many points of view. But attachment insecurity refers within the clinical psychology field to a problematic form of repeated behaviors within close relationships that interfere with the closeness, that interfere with the satisfactory relational experience. When we talk about attachment style, then that's a much broader domain that can also include, as I said, the attachment adults who have attachment security, but show maybe a little more avoidant pattern during times of relational stress, or might get a little more anxious about, you know, the, the presence and the availability of the, of the partner during times of in, in internal or, or external focused stress. So attachment style is something that, again, each one of us has. Each, every single person, secure or insecure, will have a preferred form of uh, defensive ways of being during relational stress. In the clinical domain, the most widely recognized and accepted and powerful tool for determining attachment security or insecurity is called the Adult Attachment Interview, the AAI. The AI is a 20-question structured interview where somebody trained to give the interview presents these questions to the interviewee, and all the questions have something to do with attachment experience, talking about asking questions about early history, early relationships with parents, experiences of trauma and abuse in the family or outside of the family, experiences of loss in the family or outside of the family. Um, and based on not only what the person says in response to these questions, but how the person says what he or she says in response to the questions, this gets assessed according to a particular very elaborate scoring system that was developed for the AI. And one of the four subtypes is, is determined based on that. Okay, so it's a rather elaborate procedure. It requires a well-trained interviewer and well-trained um, evaluator to do the scoring of the, of, the, of the interview, which can range from 60 minutes to 120 minutes, depending on, uh, or you know, even, even shorter or longer, depending on the particular person. Um, it's not a very, it's a, it's a powerful tool, but unfortunately it's not a particularly practical tool because of the time and money involved for administering or being admin having this administered for, for oneself. Um, if it's possible for uh, a person who's concerned about his or her attachment status to get this, then it's worthwhile. But again, there are practical limitations for that. Much more widely available are self-report measures for attachment status. Uh, whereas the adult attachment interview and similar interview-based methods, there are, there are several interview-based methods. AI is the most prominently recognized one. Um, again, it requires two people. It's, you know, person asking questions, the interviewee responding, the interviewer asking follow-up questions, and it's a, it's a dynamic interplay. Self-report measures are just that, that I see certain questions, I'm asked certain questions, I give particular response, you know, A, B, C, or D, or, you know, indicate how how much a particular uh, uh, description applies to my relational experience. 
So, for example, one question might be, um, uh, I feel comfortable getting close with people. And then I'm asked to rate on a scale of one to seven how, how much that applies to me. Another question might be, uh, I'm usually afraid my partner will leave me. And the same thing I endorse on a scale of one to seven, uh, how, how, how fitting that is for my, my relational experience. These are widely available. They have strengths in that they're widely available. They're rather quick. You can computer, you can have computerized scoring to provide responses immediately after completing these kinds of tests. Uh, the problem is they can suffer some suffer from self-report bias. Somebody who wants to present him or herself as better than he or she is in relationships, or maybe even as worse wanting to present him or herself for some reason as worse than he or she is in relationship, or because of disorganization doesn't really have a clear sense of how he or she is in relationship. So this these can affect the, the, the ultimate outcome or the, the, the particular assessment that's done based on this measure. Um, also, the AI categorizations and the self-report measure categorizations are not very well correlated. So they both measure something, but they seem to measure something that's not the same, or at least there's some lack of overlap. There's probably overlap, but there's some area of lack of overlap too. One obvious difference is that in the AI, the focus of the questions is on early attachment experience during childhood. Self-report measures typically are about adult relationship experience. And even though there is some correlation between early attachment experience and adult relationship experience, it's not a perfect correlation. And uh, so there are differences of, you know, of, of these things. All that being said, I do, I can highly recommend one particular self-report measure that's easily available. Um, if you go to a website, it's called attachmentproject.com. So funny, I'm, I'm on that. I was actually gonna ask you if that's a good quiz to take. And, and was Dan actually, I think Dan was involved with this project? Uh, Dan was involved in the, in the initial setup yep. of the attachment project. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and he, you know, before he, before he died, uh, he, Sort of became less involved with that, but the project, you know, this, the people behind, some of the people behind it have continued on, and I would say it's a good resource uh, for for people who want to learn some more about attachment. And the particular quiz that you'll when you go to the landing page on this website, um, it gives people the opportunity to take the attachment quiz. It's called the attachment quiz that's on that site is the most widely researched and validated self-report measure within the field at present. It's called the Experiences in Close Relationships Scale and the, a particular version of that, the latest version of that. So it's the ECR, ECRRS it's called. And it's rather quick to take. I think there's 36 questions or may even be fewer in that version. And immediately after completing it, you, you know, click Submit Results this is all done anonymously, by the way. You don't have to give any identifying information. Um, then you'll get a you'll get a, a narrative description of your particular attachment pattern and style based on your responses to the to the to this to this assessment. And you'll also get a get a um, a graphic representation of within the categories of secure and the three forms of insecure you'll see where you tend to be based on your responses uh, in relationship with mother, father, and romantic partners. Okay, so, so I recommend people to take this uh, as a way to learn a little more about themselves. Yeah, that's an awesome recommendation. I'm gonna put that in the show notes so uh, the listeners could check it out. And um, I think you kind of answered this question because you were, you were sharing some of this before. Uh, kind of differentiating the clinical aspect and just more of the experiential, like how we experience our own attachment. And like, is it helpful to look at attachment as a spectrum, 
meaning that nobody is completely secure or insecure. So for example, like I could, I would hope that I, at this point I am, and I don't know if I am, but that I, I'm like, say I'm secure, but I would still have avoidant patterns in times of stress. I may see avoidant patterns in relationships or somebody that may be secure, but they have anxious, preoccupied patterns in relationships. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's a way to to humanize and, and depathologize these patterns as they appear. Um, two, two colleagues that I have, um, Sue Marriott and Ann Kelly, they, they developed what they call the modern attachment spectrum. And it really is a, you know, it's a spectrum from, from uh, say, on, on one end, you know, a rather prominent avoidant tendency, you know, kind of a shutting down. I think they use a blue color to highlight that as kind of a cold, you know, like moving away from connection, defensive strategy. And on the other end, which is, which is in red, it's more the hot, the anxious, preoccupied, agitated, worried, fearful. Okay? And, and they highlight that, you know, anybody at any particular moment might appear on one particular spot along that spectrum, whereas right in the middle would be green, which is more balanced between the, the two extremes. Depending on the stresses that we encounter, relationally and otherwise, and we all experience stresses all the time, we, we might move one way or another, and we'll have kind of a preferred way to move, which is based on the overall experiences we had as a child. Even if we develop security as a child or later as an adult, we'll still have a tendency to defend, to react in, in particular ways by either shutting down the tendency to want to connect or to orient more toward and to kind of cling and grasp. And, and interestingly, if we link this now to uh, uh, I often get asked by people who have background in, in Buddhist. Yeah, it was, it's just like, I feel like we're completely connected because I was like, I started thinking about, you know, attachment aversion. I, I'm assuming that's what you're going to say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we're, we're in sync here. Definitely. Um, people often get a little confused and they say, wait a minute, you know, you're talking about attachment as a good thing, or at least secure attachment as a good thing. I, I learned from my Buddhist studies that attachment is bad. So what's you know, how does this work? And you know the use of the term is a little can, can be a little confusing. So let me try to clarify that. Um, attachment in the Buddhist domain is something that's considered problematic. Typically, it's referred to as, as you said, kind of a grasping, you know, a tendency. We, we get attached and cling to to um, to uh, you know something that we want, something that feels like it's going to give us something important. You know, we may identify with something. We we associate ourselves with you know money or fame or you know a fancy car or a certain relationship, and we sort of grasp onto that, and we get attached. And of course, in the Buddhist realm, that's identified as the domain of source of suffering. Okay? And so that Buddhist concept, construct of attachment, is, is parallel with the psychological domain of um, anxious, preoccupied, insecure attachment, that tendency to be grasping or clinging and, and needing that, that connection in order to feel okay. okay? So, so non-attachment in the Buddhist sense would be associated with security. It's not that we don't connect with things, but we don't, we can be involved with something, but we don't have to be enmeshed with it. Okay, that's non-attachment. Now, it's, it's, it would be easy to associate the avoidant or dismissing tendency in terms of insecurity with non-attachment, like a detachment. Okay, but again, there's a different sense of that. You know, um, in the Buddhist domain, in terms of sources of suffering, or you can say the three, you know, one, one way it's been framed is, is the three poisons. So the three poisons would include grasping, which I just talked about. It would also include avoiding, okay, 
And that would be sort of a, a detachment in a problematic way rather than a healthy non-attachment. So if we pull away from something and we're avoiding it, you know, we have aversion. So grasping and aversion are two of the poisons. Again, anxious, preoccupied, avoidant in the insecure domain. And the third poison is ignorance or missing something. That would be associated with a more disorganized form. Um, maybe being disorganized in such a way that we're, we're dissociated, okay? And we actually use as a defense uh, shutting down from connection with something. So these are three forms of insecurity within the psychological domain that also have reference parallels within the Buddhist domain. But I think the understanding of the terminology becomes important. So secure attachment is associated with healthy non-attachment, with non-grasping, non-aversion, and, and non-ignorance. Okay? Um, attachment within the Buddhist domain is associated with um, the various forms of insecurity. Was that, is that clear the way I... Yeah, yeah. I love that you brought that in. I love that you brought Buddhism in and, and the three poisons. Uh, you know, they're also formulated as uh, greed, hatred and ignorance. And um, uh -huh. yeah. And, and for me, it's like like I could definitely see like I, I think I have avoidant patterns and I also have aversive patterns. So it's like tending to push things away. And um, yeah, it's like I, I guess with with the attachment thing with, you, you know, you can enjoy something like a piece of cake, right? You would be able to enjoy a piece of cake, but clinging to it would be wanting another piece. Like, oh, it's so good. I want another <laughs> piece, you know, or um, in, in the aversive type, it's like if somebody's, you know, out there <laughs> mowing the lawn or making noise and it's like, instead of just allowing like the, the unpleasantness of it or whatever to permeate it, just going like, yeah, it's going to pass. I know it's impermanent. I know it's going to pass. I'm like pushing it away. I'm like, why are they making all this noise? That's like the aversive pattern, but I love that you brought that in, and um, I, I think it will resonate with a lot of the listeners. And um, yeah, so I think the other—I mean, there's many other questions, and um, maybe that we can talk a little bit about the process that you employ for helping repair insecure attachment. Oh, sure. And I think you call it the three pillars treatment approach. Yes. Maybe you could just kind of talk about each of those three pillars and like why they're helpful and how they work. Great. Okay. Well, as a foundation for that, let me say a little bit more about factors that contribute developmentally to secure attachment, because it's our understanding of what promotes secure attachment in infants based on their relational dynamic with their caregivers that serves as the foundation for what we know to be effective for treatment, for psychotherapy, for adults with insecure attachment. Um, so from, from all the wonderful research and exploration that's been done for approaching 100 years now within the field of uh, attachment in Western psychology, there's a lot that's been identified as parental behaviors that tend to support attachment security. Um, Mary Ainsworth talked about maternal responsiveness as a general category that tends to support the attachment security. So again, a lot been written about this, a lot of description. Dan Brown and I and the others who, who work together to you know, pull this model and this set of methods together develop something that we call the five conditions that promote secure attachment. And we don't say we made these up, but we say that we created this, you know, this framework that incorporates all that's known out there and highlights what we consider to be the particularly important elements. So let me, let me go through those so, so those are clear. So each one involves parental behavior that we think will promote attachment security and the infant experience based on that behavior that becomes important for this security to develop within the infant. Okay. So for example, 
it's important for a child to feel more often than not safe in connection with the caregivers and that the caregiver will be available to promote and create safety anytime the child is feeling there's some threat or risk or danger. This is fundamental to attachment security. This is fundamental to mm, the biological basis for attachment, that there are various threats that will occur always as, uh, with, the, with the infant in, in the world. The threats from the outside and threats from the inside, if there's like an illness or a sickness that develops. Um, so the parent ideally provides protection more often than not. And the infant, more often than not, in relation to the caregiver, feels safe. You, you, you and your listeners, our listeners at the moment, have probably noticed that I've often said more often than not. And this is, let me, let me highlight why this is important too. Um, a lot of parents become very frightened and concerned, particularly if there's a tendency toward anxious preoccupation, to think, oh no, I have to be there for the best possible ways for my child. I need to help them develop attachment security. What if I'm, what if I'm not a good enough parent and I, and I do the wrong things and they develop insecurity or something bad happens? Okay? That's a common experience, of course, that parents have. But parents don't have to be there and do all the right things 100% of the time. And in fact, doing all the right things, like meeting every, every need that the child has moment to moment, you know, as soon as the need arises, that actually will create more problems for the child than less. Because if a child has his or her needs always met right away, what's one effect of that? There won't be the opportunity to develop frustration tolerance. There won't be the opportunity to be able to handle outside of the 100% there parent when the world isn't 100% there, when the world is disappointing. If the child has learned through experience that sometimes there's disappointment with caregivers, that will be transferred to later adult life when disappointing experiences happen and the child then or the, uh, the later adult can say, yeah, okay, this is hard, I'm disappointed, but you know, I can handle this, it's okay. So I like to think that more often than not means if a parent can, say, provide these five conditions that promote secure attachment, maybe 70% of the time, again, not a hard number, but you know, roughly 70% of the time, that's more often than not, that will actually best promote the security and all the developmental dynamics within the child. So, child feels safe and secure more often than not in the context of the parent. The parent is able to provide protection and uh, uh, when that's needed for the child. Second condition is the parent being attuned to the states of the child. The parent being present and attentive in a way that helps the, the parent interpret what's going on with the child even before he or she's able to speak and describe what's going on. The child experience is being seen and known and valued. Okay? When a parent is attentive, is interested and available and really wants to understand what's going on with the child, the child will feel seen and known. That's a very important component. I mentioned upset and soothing earlier on. When a child is upset and distressed, which of course children are often upset and distressed, if more often than not, because of attunement to the child's states, the caregiver can provide soothing and comforting that meets the child's needs in that moment, that will be a support for security and, as I referred to earlier, a support for developing emotion regulation skills because the experience of being soothed by the caregiver gets internalized. And then later in life, when I'm upset, oh yeah, okay, well, I know how to handle this. I can, I can do it. Or I know who to go to to get some help. Because as a child, I could go to my primary caregivers for help when I was upset. So that's the third. The fourth condition would be the, the child feeling valued and 
cherished even by the by the by the parent by the caregivers and the caregiver's part it's the caregiver being delighted by the very being of the child not only what the child does you know like getting you know like you know behaving the way that the parent wants him or her to but just simply for being the child's self the parent is delighted by that shows that through uh, facial expression shows that through verbal expression shows that through hugging through contact you know i love you you're so you're just such a wonderful baby you know more often than not the child experiences that the parents are delighted in in him or herself his very being again no parent is going to be delighted all the time by by a child <laughs> a lot plenty of the time child parents going to be really frustrated and really upset it's like oh well i know i know i got two <laughs> i got two little ones right, right now one is one and a half the other one is is three so oh my goodness it's crazy and but when you speak about the delight i feel it in my heart like just the warmth <laughs> But there's also the fr there's also many moments of frustration. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah, that's normal, and and that you can have and honor the experiences of frustration in the context of also knowing that you have that just fundamental delight, uh, you know, with with your children. That's that's beautiful, and that's and they'll take that in, you know, they will they will they will take that in, even if it doesn't seem like it right away when they're in this challenging developmental phase or phases. The, uh, and so the fifth condition is the parent being able to support the child's exploration and discovery. Okay. This usually is something that occurs a little bit later during young you know, infancy and young childhood when the child starts to you know, explore a little bit more. It can happen very early in terms of just, say, seeing a, a mobile hanging over the crib and the, and the, and the baby gets interested in that. You know, an attuned present parent supporting the exploration will notice the baby seeing those hanging figures being drawn to the motion and the color and the light and kind of go, oh, yes, how wonderful. It's like supporting the experience of that. So this actually supports not particularly well, in the context of the attachment relationship, of a secure promoting attachment, security promoting attachment relationship, the infant and young child will have the experience that the attachment figure is encouraging attention away from the attachment figure sometimes, even if it's in relation with the attachment figure. Over time, when there's security that develops, that security fundamentally gives the child the sense that okay, my caregiver will be here whenever I need it, whenever I need him or her. But right now I don't need that. I feel pretty comfortable, pretty confident, and wow, look at that. On the other side of the room, wow, what's that? And I'm going to crawl over and get that. Okay? Moving away from the caregiver, from the attachment connection in the moment. But if there's a secure base internalized, which is a hallmark of attachment security, according to Mary Ainsworth, I can crawl over to that thing on the other side of the room and explore it because I know that if I get afraid or if something happens or I just want to go back and make contact, I can count on the reliable availability of my caregiver. So something happens, I get scared, <gasps> I, I get upset and I crawl back really fast and, and then mom is there to, to hug me and hold me or dad is there to reassure me. Okay, So support for exploration or discovery. So here's a context. Within the field of attachment therapy, John Bowlby highlighted, he was the first one to really explicitly highlight, although he also was influenced by some other practitioners within the psycho psychoanalytic field, um, that in order to change the insecure internal working model, internal representations of problematic early relational experience. The adult needs to have new and different and positive relational experience. So 
the therapeutic frame that developed out of this is what I refer to as the therapist as good attachment figure model. So the therapist tries to be a good attachment figure with the patient or the client, to be present, to be attuned and responsive, to be soothing when the person's upset, to be delighted by the very nature and very being of the, of the person, the patient, the client, and encouraging exploration in terms of inner exploration, which is part of the therapy process, and outer exploration to support that in the, in the person's life outside of therapy too. So this can be very, very effective and very beneficial. And it's again, it's been the prominent model for decades within the field of, of psych psychology and psychotherapy for attachment insecurity. There have been various um, uh, forms and, and refinements of this approach within the field. Um, uh, Diana Fosha, for one, with her AEDP, Applied Experiential Dynamic Psychotherapy, she really leans into the moment-to-moment attunement and, 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 and elaborated and exaggerated even responsiveness to the moment-to-moment -moment experience of the, of the client in the therapy. Uh, again, providing what would be referred to within the field as a corrective emotional experience, okay, to be, for the, for the in, in Diana Foch's term, to undo the sense of aloneness that the uh, adult person has in relation to, to a close other, to undo the sense of maybe threat or danger in the connection with the other person. So, so any anyway, her work is, is really quite good and, 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 and can be very, very effective. Dan Brown and I and the others that, that developed this, this model, the three pillars model, as you referred to, um, incorporate the therapist as good attachment figure approach, but also modify it so that some of the problems with that approach, the limitations of that approach, are, we think, remedied. Okay. First of all, the first pillar I should highlight here, if anyone who goes to the book or, or learns something about the three pillars model otherwise, the, the way we initially conceived of this model is that the first pillar is the use of, of relational imagery, mental imagery, in the context of the psychotherapy process, where in the context of a, of a safe and secure security promoting type of relationship within the therapy between adult person and adult therapist. That together, there's a co-creation of engaged imaginative experience of the patient being a young child in connection with a new and different positive parent or set of parents. Okay, so the first pillar was creating this mental imagery to, um, to support the new and different positive relational experience to replace the old insecure attachment internal working model. The second pillar was metacognitive development, essentially helping the person as an adult develop greater um, perspective, ability to take perspective on one's own experience and others' experience. This actually can be part of what undoes the, the cognitive rigidity that tends to be present when there's insecurity. So various ways of promoting metacognition, um, capacity for broader and broader perspective taking, which is a, an underlying element of, of mental health in general, we would say. And the third pillar was the focus on the particular relational experience between the the client or patient and the and the therapist, the two adults in the room. And this is this would be the domain particularly of the therapist as good attachment figure model. Now those that was the order of the three pillars as we initially presented them. Recently um, we're seeing it differently. We're actually inverting the whole model of pillars. So the first pillar is the relationship foundation. Second pillar is still in the same place in the middle. 
uh, the third pillar now is the particular method or technique that can be applied within the context of the first two pillars to support the creation of the new and different internal working model and, and, and attachment experience. So, so, so that's the way we're looking at it now. Let me tell you why we're bringing in mental imagery as, a, as the particular method that occurs within this context. Even though we agree that the new and positive relationship in the therapy process will be beneficial for the insecure patient and will tend to orient and promote the movement toward earned security, we think that because of the way internal representations get formed based on experience, that though it's very likely that this new and positive experience in the therapy relationship will get internalized into a new and positive internal working model, new and positive attachment representation. Because the adult patient is not a child and the therapist is not a parent, the new positive internal working model will be of this new adult relationship with patient as adult, therapist as adult therapist, not as parent, and will kind of coexist with the original internal working model of young, vulnerable infant and young child self with actual parent self. Okay? The therapist is not the patient's parent, even if he or she tries to be parental. And the, th the client patient knows that. The adult patient is not a child. Okay? And so the experience will be different. Also, even as much as the therapist might try to be the good attachment figure, there are limitations in what can happen in the therapy. So for example, one of the supports for developing security as a child is a lot of physical contact, safe and warm and supportive and comforting and soothing physical contact. There are limitations in what's appropriate within an adult to adult therapy relationship where mm, the therapist, you know, maybe there can be, you know, a brief hug every now and then if it's, if it's, if it's appropriate. But, you know, the, we don't want the patient coming and sitting on the therapist's lap and the therapist hugging and rocking and cradling. I mean, maybe in some therapeutic context that's okay, but, but generally that's problematic, especially with a patient who has been abused as a child in some way. So if the, when the attachment feelings get stirred up in the therapy relationship and the patient may want to have more physical contact with the, with the, with the therapist, and if the therapist says, well, you know, I appreciate that, but, you know, we have a therapy relationship, we have to set some limits on that, that actually can be taken as a rejection. Okay? Maybe the patient as child early on wanted physical contact from the avoidant parent and the parent was dismissive of that and rejecting of that desire for contact. In the adult therapy process, if that patient was wanting contact with the therapist and the therapist says no because of therapy protocol we can't really do that that can be actually reinforcing of that negative internal working model okay a few other you know a few other reasons why there are a few other limitations that can happen in the therapy uh, with, with the therapist as good attachment figure model but when we use mental imagery we are supporting the patient as adult coming into a direct experiential moment of feeling himself or herself as a young child, feeling connected in the body like a, being a very young child, making that imaginative experience as vivid as possible. You know, we, we, we support the person going inward and feeling the body sense. We might do a body scan or focus on the breathing a little bit, some sort of even mindful awareness of the moment-to-moment -moment experience of the body. This helps activate the early dynamic processing and memory system, operating systems, if you will, that were present during the first two years of life when the attachment representations were formed. 
So as an adult, if the person feels into the body and then imagines being a very young child, we can actually get closer to the formative conditions that created the original attachment representations, which makes them makes the original ones more likely to be modified, let's say. When the patient is imagining being a young child and feeling that from the inside, then we suggest that the, ther the therapist who's holding this process suggests that he or she imagine being with parents, but not the original parents, but new and different parents who are just right for the patient as child. We referred to this initially as the ideal parent figure method. So to imagine ideal or just right parents who would be able to be responsive and present and provide all the five conditions that support attachment security for the patient as child. So this imagery is co-created. The therapist is holding the context, is guiding the patient through the imagery process, is attuned and present with the patient who is in midst of the imagery process, having this very vivid, new, positive relational experience. And I think of it as a meta-relational process, a meta-relational dynamic, because this mental imagery experience that closely approximates the formative conditions for attachment security is being done in the context of the therapy itself, the therapist as good attachment figure who's present and attuned and protective and, and holding the process for the, for the patient during the imagery. So it's, it's, there's the relationship within the imagery that's transformative, and there's the holding relationship, the relationship that holds the imagery itself. So there's a, 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 a double dose, let's say, of the positive relational experience that we find to be very effective and very efficient for creating the earned security. And there are various modifications of how this is done depending on the insecure subtype. Um, and this, this is all very detailed in our, in our book and, and uh, as, it's, as it's described in other places. So, so that's, the, that's the overview of the, of the therapy process that we use. Yeah, um, very in-depth and fascinating stuff. And I just want to be mindful of the time because we did agree on this time. Okay. Uh, but I want to check with you if maybe we can do another 10, 15 minutes, if that's okay. Maybe I could ask another question or two. That's I'm really... okay with me. And let me actually take a couple of those minutes to add one more thing about mental imagery. And yes, please, please, please do. Yeah. Those of you, the, you and, 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 and our listeners who, who have some familiarity with, say, sports psychology or the field of performance enhancement, performance excellence within Within, within sports particularly, are probably familiar with how widely applied mental imagery is now for training for, for sports. Uh, so for example, it's quite normal now, this is sort of usual as part of preparation for Olympic events, say a downhill skiing event, that a skier, in addition to actually running, making runs on the mountain and you know, maybe on the actual course where the race will be held. Um, in addition to that, when off the slopes, the racer will actually imagine being on the slopes and as vividly as possible, imagine oneself in a physical way during at each turn, going around each, each post, each flag, each mogul, each, each component, and to feel very, very vividly the, the particular activity that is being anticipated. It's recognized within the, the field of sports psychology that this kind of practice actually enhances the skill, enhances the performance of the, of, <clears throat> of the athlete beyond just doing the, you know, the physical, actual physical runs. <clears throat> if, you, if you measure the muscular activity, of the skier while he or she's imagining going down the mountain, the same muscles that are used when actually skiing show activity. They show, of course, much to a less, much lesser degree, but the body is learning. There's a muscle memory that can be developed through the use of the imagination. 
neuroscience research has highlighted that when we imagine a new experience that's in certain kind of category, it activates the same cortical structures and networks, the same brain structures and networks that are active when we're remembering an experience in the similar category. So this highlights that when we use imagination, we actually can activate the brain systems that are relevant to whatever experiences we had that laid down the particular effects of those experiences. And this is one reason why we think that envisioning through imagination in a very embodied way is some is a way to, to actually transform insecure internal working models from in, from two secure ones. Okay, so mental imagery is a very powerful tool that when incorporated into the context of a therapist as good attachment figure holding relationship, uh, we think makes the treatment itself more effective, more effective and more efficient. Yeah, um, power of visualization is fascinating, and, and that's what you're speaking on. I, and I know like Dan Brown was huge on that, and he'd have all these, you know, he did hypnosis, and he would have these guided meditations and this like envisioning your highest vision, your highest purpose. And I always found those uh, meditations so um, uh, just like very powerful and invigorating and like very connecting. So I think that's really important, important thing. And it, and it translates beyond attachment, like you said, to performance psychology and sports. And Dan drew, Dan drew what you're, what, you know, what drew this initially from, again, going back to Buddhist, uh, practices and principles for development. So the tantric tradition of, of visualizing particular deities with qualities that we would want to have within ourselves, and then imagining actually internalizing that whole deity with those qualities so that we can start to feel that physically and experientially within ourselves. So, so this, this, this modern contemporary use of visualization, or sometimes I like to say mental imagery because it it goes beyond the visual it includes and it includes other modalities as well so so but the modern application of this in this therapeutic process has roots that are actually thousands of years old yeah it's fascinating so like this is one question that i've that i want to ask um is it possible to repair insecure attachment outside the context of therapy and instead in our day-to-day -day relationships? Fortunately, yes. Yes. So, you know, as I referred to earlier, the, the insecure attachment in adults is, is quite pervasive. So if we say, you know, even if just 40% of adults in America are, are, uh, are insecure, you know, 40% of 330 million people is a lot of people. Not everybody has access to psychotherapy. Sadly, you know, there's a crisis within, the, within our societies and worldwide in terms of mental health issues. Um, therapists, you know, do what, do what we can, and, uh, but not everybody has access to therapists. Hopefully that will become less and less of a problem for very, in various ways over time. But, but, and then even with therapists, you know, many therapists don't have training or understanding of attachment issues. So, so, uh, you know, even people who can find themselves, you know, in a therapy, uh, and can afford it and can have the time and the circumstance for it, uh, may not have a kind of therapy that more effectively resolves the insecurity. So good thing is that even though if by around two years of age, there's an, an insecure internal working model for close relationships, and that is rather stable by about two years of age because of the mental structures and patterns that, that create it, if a child has new and different positive experiences after that, then the internal working model can change. So for example, if because of challenges and difficulties internally and externally that, that parents have in raising a child the first few years, 
created insecurity in that child. If the parent's life circumstances shift or their personal circumstances shift or they get therapy or you know something good happens for them where they're actually able to be more present for the child, able to manifest the five conditions on the parent's side that promote secure attachment, then the child will have those experiences and will internalize those and that will modify the internal working model. It's also the case that even children whose parents were initially created or were, whose parenting initially contributed to the insecurity, even if those parents unfortunately didn't find some resolution of that and continued to create conditions that reinforce the insecurity in the child, as the child develops and grows, new and different experiences with other important people will get internalized. So say there's you know, a teacher in, in first grade or third grade or sixth grade or a coach or a neighbor or some grandparents or you know, somebody else that the child starts to feel a sense of bonding with, a sense of relational connection with that will get internalized. And again, even though those figures would not be the child's parents, there's still an internalization process that happens. And the earlier it happens, the more likely it is to transform the internal working model from insecure to secure. If it doesn't happen till adulthood, it is not uncommon that somebody with but one adult who has one of the insecure patterns, say, is, uh, is avoidant or dismissing, gets involved with someone who has a more solidly secure uh, attachment status, that actually can, that, that adult romantic close relationship can actually promote security developing within the, um, within the, uh, adult as well who was insecure. That happens all the time it, because the majority of people who are insecure, let's say, if we, if we think of a group of people, adults who were insecure, who then developed security, some portion of those would develop the security because they went to therapy, effective therapy. Some portion of those would transition to earn security because of life experiences. I don't know you know, what percentage is, you know, how to divide that up. But I think there's a substantial number of adults who develop earned security because of new and positive life experiences, even without therapy. Uh, and that's a good thing because, again, not everybody can access therapy. Yeah, that's good news. That's great news. And uh, I think there's a lot that you share that's very positive and, and hopeful for us. Uh, like the, the idea of just good good at being a good enough parent and having good enough attachment like not not 100 percent of the time 70 percent of the time like that's good enough and and just the fact that humans are so resilient and, and we could have therapeutic relationships and connections in our day-to-day -day life not just in the therapy context and um yeah this is amazing news um yeah, this has been like a really fascinating conversation. Uh, there was definitely pieces and like I've been, I'm not done with the book yet. I'm still reading it. Uh, but there's d definitely been pieces that I'm picking up and new things that I didn't know through this conversation with you. I'm curious if there is anything that you wish that, that I would have asked you or is there anything else that you would like to share before we wrap up? Yeah, well, just, just one, one thought about your highlighting, you know, that, uh, you know, good enough is is just right. Good enough parenting is just right. Um, there's another phrase that I that I that I like, which is you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Sort of the ideal parent actually has lapses sometimes. The ideal parent sometimes is not attuned, and then the child becomes distressed, and then maybe that distress will contribute to attunement that the parent will have, and then can provide soothing, reattunement and soothing. But maybe the parent doesn't become reattuned and the child just has to be distressed for a while. Again, that's an important experience to have because if we have good enough distress, not too much, not too little, 
we will develop our capacity to be more resilient when we face distress inevitably as we will in our later lives. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's one thought. Yeah. It's an important point. Uh, and I guess quick, one more question. Um, so one of the things that I also do is uh, I do culture and leadership development, um, at a psychotherapy place is actually my wife's business. She's a therapist and she has clinicians working underneath her. So, uh, part of my job and because I'm so entrenched in mental health, I'm always learning about new modalities and different things and trying to introduce that to the clinicians. And I'm curious if I know you do a lot of these trainings internationally. I'm curious if you do any of these trainings, uh, like, uh, teaching the three pillar approach, if you do it online or if there's any other pathways for clinicians or mental health professionals where they can learn this approach because I, I'm seeing how important this aspect of attachment is and I think it's still kind of overlooked so like this is just something that I would love to equip our clinicians with going forward in the future so really great question and and um, you know I, I have for for quite a few years now been been teaching this you know in various places teaching workshops to clinicians. And, and that's been great. I love doing the teaching and, and, and seeing the excitement that the therapists have when they kind of understand these principles and, and how to apply them. And also hearing about the effectiveness, you know, when they follow up about applying it in their practices. But um, there's, there's such a, you know, I would like to reach many more people than is possible through just doing, you know, series of workshops here and there, even online. So one thing that I'm involved with at the present is developing uh, an online-based training for the level one, for the foundational um, principles and practices that uh, would be appropriate for any clinician who is wanting to learn more about this and possibly integrate it in, into their practices. This would be a, uh, this will be a multimedia, self-paced, um, online platform on a platform that will allow the clinician to go through various modules at his or her own pace and uh, probably be, you know, a total, we're not quite sure, it'll be like 30 or 40 hours uh, uh, of online experience. There'll be videos, there'll be text, there'll be links to outside resources that will provide, you know, important uh, elements as well. A couple of live sessions as well for questions and answers. Mm, I'm developing this with a couple of colleagues and we hope to launch it in the springtime. And this, <clears throat> this would be, again, the level one training, which might be sufficient for many people who, you know, don't want to integrate it more fully, but might benefit from understanding some of the principles and practices. The level two training and level three beyond level one would be for clinicians who really want to go more deeply into into uh, expertise in these in these methods, and uh, sort of to become certified to you know to to apply to apply this in a in a very particular way. So we want to make available to a wider range of people uh, different levels of access to these principles and methods, depending on what they feel would be appropriate for, for them personally and professionally. Yeah, um, this, that's, I'm, I'm happy that you're doing this and I'll be happy to share this with our clinicians, those that are interested in, in, in learning more about attachment and repairing attachment. I think this will be a great tool. And yeah, I mean, it's clear that you know this stuff down to the bone and like you've embodied it, all this, this knowledge. Um, I mean, you, you hear it through you speaking and if you read, if you read the book, you just see how in depth it is. It's almost like, it's like the book is like a therapist almost in itself. It's like, I'm just like, wow, it just shows you all these like pieces and like all these examples of what to say in a specific, uh, situation. And like, yeah, it's just very in depth, very comprehensive, very integrated. I really appreciate you putting this work together and, um, yeah, it's just, it's been great to having you on the show and having you share your wisdom. I uh, really appreciate it, David. Uh, you're so welcome, Artem. And, and I, again, so much appreciate your interest in this and enthusiasm. It's been great to, to have this dialogue and, and uh, thank you very much. 
Yes. Thanks so much. Wish you all the best. And I uh, hope to be in contact in the future. Indeed. Take care.